So my name is Jason Grillo. I'm the event director for Air Miners. Wonderful to see you all here today. Uh, today, we're going to talk through some of the funding uh, underpinnings of our industry, knowing that you know there are you know, certainly a good number of leading innovative companies, but also a good number of very early stage startups that haven't yet achieved uh, their entry into market. How to get there is sometimes a very twisted path, but um, the funding milestones are critical on that journey. Today, uh, we're gonna have representatives from uh, who can speak to on our panel? Who can speak to policy, to from an entrepreneur and from an entrepreneur standpoint, and from a venture standpoint? And Tito's going to be leading uh, the discussion with each of those uh, groups of people in turn in a minute or two. Uh, a couple notes on logistics. Uh, for one, it's a bit of a departure from our uh, typical format where we have a free flowing panel discussion. Today, it's going to be a little bit more of a you know vertically drilling down, diving deeply into each of these aspects. Uh, you know, Peter's going to start it all off with a conversation with Xiao Yang from venture capital firm 50 years, and then go into each of those uh, conversations. Uh, then we'll have Q&A period until the top of the hour when I'll come on at the end. And uh, we'll start after 60 minutes uh, at 1 p.m. Pacific. We'll start in on our post-event networking through our Zoom meeting uh, function into breakout rooms. So feel free to stay for that. We'd love for you to do so. Uh, but don't feel like you have to. And uh, that's a little bit of how we're going to operate today. So thanks everyone for coming. And Tito, why don't you take us away? All right. Great to see you all. Uh, last time I remember kind of doing a big, uh, big Air Miners event. We were talking about the launch of Air Miners, Air Miners Launchpad, helping uh, create a thousand shots on goal for carbon removal. Uh, and, and, you know, building off of that, how do we, how do we, create more solutions for carbon removal, uh, we've been working on how to invest and how to fund these companies. And so I, I got to call up Xiao and, and we got to talking about, okay, what's needed in this space? What's missing in this space? And Xiao, where, uh, where did that conversation go? Yeah, so I, I am most definitely the stupidest person in this room. And so I was, I was very grateful Tito called and I was hoping to learn more about this space as well. And so just for a little bit of context, um, at 50 years, our mission is to support the world's best founders as they solve some of the world's biggest problems using science and technology. And of course, what could be a more exciting problem that needs solving than this idea of uh, carbon removal in the atmosphere. But truth be told, I have been uh, really, really hesitant to find opportunities in the space because of some of these kind of fundamental concerns that I had about it. And really, this whole exercise has just been an elaborate way for me to address probably some of my ignorance. So I really appreciate everyone's participation today. Um, and so just a little bit of context of my ignorance. Whenever I look at opportunities, I, I like to imagine that there is this like cold hearted capitalist and you know, uh, I, I grew up in the 90s so it, it's like the Mr Burns prototype from the Simpsons that I imagine, and I like to imagine like would Mr Burns be excited about this business opportunity, and when we find things that both make the world a better place and that the Mr Burns person would be excited about these are typically opportunities that we get really, really excited about, but every time I came to companies that drew a lot of their revenue from the carbon markets, this made me hesitate. I just wasn't sure yet whether the carbon markets as a source of revenue could be uh, a Mr. Burns kind of style business. I looked at what happened during the 2008, 2011 downturns in the markets, a lot of money left. Um, is this just one economic downturn from going away? I also looked at some of the strong regulatory and policy side stuff happening in Europe, but perhaps absent from some of the stuff happening locally here in North America. And so in that to that end, I want everyone here to convince me that it's actually okay for like cold hearted venture capitalists to really say, hey, we're going to put the foot to the pedal to the metal, put the foot to the floor and really fund amazing founders doing stuff in this space. And a big thank you ahead of time for helping to address my ignorance. Awesome. Great, great perspective. I think that's really important coming into the, the carbon removal marketplace discussion. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of work on carbon utilization in terms of let's make useful things out of, out of carbon. And this is different. This is a, a, an emerging market, and we're going to be talking with uh, 
our, our four uh, panelists today about that. Uh, we've got uh, Sophie and Kim from Climate Tech VC. Uh, we've also got uh, Peter Miner from Carbon 180 and Diego Sayez Gill from Pachama. So when you think about roles, we're gonna be diving in with, with Sophie and Kim to understand the kind of the venture capital perspective. Uh, Peter's gonna be uh, diving into more of the regulatory markets. Uh, what, are these, what are these marketplaces look like? Uh, and then Diego is going to be lending the entrepreneurial perspective. And again, this is all under this, 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 this umbrella of what do investors need to know? So this isn't really focused on what, what entrepreneurs need to know, what founders need to know. Um, obviously, Airmires is a great resource for that. We've got a whole YouTube channel stuff. But this is specifically for, for investors. What do you need to know? Um, so kicking it off with, uh, with, with over to, to Sophie and Kim. Uh, great, to, great to have been talking over this topic with you. Um, Let's see where where do we start? So so Chow is, has this has this skepticism, wondering if this is an emerging market. Uh, you've been tracking this. You've been looking at the at the data following following these deals. What are you seeing from from the perspective of climate tech? Your climate tech VC work. Yeah, thanks so for having us. First of all, um, Kim and I write a newsletter called Climate Tech VC, and hope that you all consider joining 20,000 other folks in this space, subscribing to it. And we're happy to do the dirty work for you, tracking all of the deals and news in this space and um, synthesize lots of different segments, including including uh, a big segment that we call carbon that Kim can help break out for you. Yeah, so just to, just to take a step back, Sophie and I um, founded Climate Tech VC around two years ago now. Um, we do this part-time, but it's almost like a full-time job. Uh, but in our actual day jobs, we're both investors. I'm an investor at EIP, um, and Sophie is a climate tech investor as well. And so the way that we kind of think about carbon tech, so if you've looked at our mid-year uh, CTVC report, we have this bucket called carbon, which includes um, carbon removal, but it also includes carbon tracking and accounting, carbon offsetting, and carbon utilization, like Tito said. So just a quick quickly high level walk through those different sectors and what they mean, because I think they all have a lot of really strong implications for carbon removal. Carbon removal is more of the kind of pickaxe tools to remove carbon. So think of um, more permanent solutions like mineralization or direct air capture um, or other solutions like nature-based carbon removal. Then there's the carbon tracking and accounting sector, which is more around how do we get corporates, enterprises to better track and account for their emissions using different tools and around measurement and reporting. Um, then there's a kind of carbon offsetting bucket more around how can we measure, verify, report, um, develop marketplaces to enable the purchasing of high quality carbon offsets. Um, and then finally, there's kind of the carbon utilization bucket. How do we recycle carbon emissions into useful materials like construction materials, uh, chemicals or fuels, uh, even protein and food. So those are kind of the four high level sectors we think of when we say carbon. And, you know, there's actual tools to remove carbon, but all of these pieces are super critical when we think about developing a supply and demand kind of market to enable investors to want to obviously put money into this and to enable returns in the space and overall just carbon removal in general. So looking uh, at the data that we put together, we track from the bottoms up, um, all of the kind of venture funding data for the carbon markets and for all of these different sectors. So um, have been tracking it, I think for two years now. So when we look at um, the first half of this year and compare that against the previous half of the year, which is I think the time when carbon tech and carbon removal really started to activity, at least from the venture side really has started to spike up. For carbon tech specifically, so for this overall market, um, I think the, it grew from around 100 million in funding to almost 300 million in funding. So 3x over you know, half a year. And then from a deal side perspective, it basically 2x from around 10 deals to, more, to 24 deals. So it's definitely a clear kind of two to 3x jump, both on the funding and the deal side. And then when we look at carbon removal specifically, so the pickaxe tools to remove carbon, like the direct air capture, the forestry solutions, um, the market there grew from around uh, almost 4x, so from around 20 million to 80 million, and then um, 5x in terms of deals as well. So very clear in the data that there's been a venture investor spike in interest within carbon removal and carbon tech in general. But I think we can kind of dig into uh, Shao's question around 
why exactly that is, why is there an interest now, even though there isn't, you know, a lot of people believe there isn't a market besides the voluntary market and the corporate kind of Microsoft and Stripes purchasing it. So we'll just lay that data out there to start as a foundation. Tito, feel free to jump in here. Otherwise we'll start pontificating. Um, but all right, pontification I... starting. Yes. Um, so incredible 3x right of this sub segment but i'll just contextualize it not to be a downer here but of the 16 billion or so that we've been tracking over the last 18 months in climate tech generally speaking um this is a very small sliver of it so it's about five percent or so of the total capital capital that we're seeing flowing into the space and of the thousand individual investment firms that have participated in any of the 600 or so climate tech deals over this time period. Granted, you know, some of those thousand might not have actively been looking for climate tech deals, but we've tagged them as participating in a climate tech deal. A very small percentage of those have participated in these quite niche and obviously climate specific carbon deals. So carbon's really like either, you can either see it as the bullseye or the fringe, depending on your perspective of climate tech today. And it's really folks that are looking for that additional intense, um, you know, climate core impact um, that are investing along these lines. So we can we can think about why that might be. Um, you know, I'd also like to toss out some questions. We don't have all of the answers here. Um, I think some interesting perspectives to hit, and I'd love Peter and Diego to chime in on as well. Is this concept of um, uh, you know, price is the really key variable here. And I think that price is strongly dependent on this concept of permanence when we're talking about carbon offsets or removals. Um, essentially, what is that denominator and what's the willingness to pay um, for a change in time series for that denominator per unit of carbon? I haven't seen that be defined yet. And then a large open question amongst investors that are um, getting curious in this space around um, some common vocabulary, if you will, around um, uh, the types of technologies in carbon removal and in carbon offsetting. We've talked about it previously as nature-based versus kind of mechanical. Um, and uh, I'm personally not convinced that's necessarily the best way to be framing up these different, this uh, spectrum of solutions in the future. I think um, maybe maybe defining that along this concept of permanence would, would be more relevant. For example, mineralization, uh, seems relatively nature-based with an aid perhaps from some mechanical, where do you place that, but yet it's hypothetically permanent. So um, just tossing that out as an example of one that might break the definition there. Yeah, and just, and just to take a step back with all of this, I think the reason why we're talking about carbon removal today is because it's kind of a, a clear essential tool in the toolbox when we think about how do we get to that two degrees Celsius mark. In the IPCC report, everyone's you know read that carbon removal, carbon capture is going to be pretty essential to scale down um, our emissions over the next 10 to 15 years. So at some point, um, it's kind of a question of, you know, when does this happen, I think? So as an investor in this space at EIP, you know, we, we started looking at deep decarbonization solutions and have looked at different pathways to get there, all the way from hydrogen and electrification um, to, to carbon capture. And so a lot of people right now think that this price per ton of CO2 for carbon removal is the primary barrier. Right now it's around, I think carbon engineering or Climeworks cited at, as $600 in, in one of their report. Um, but if you look at a lot of these decarbonization pathways, especially for harder to decarbonize sectors like aviation or heavy transport, um, in some ways carbon capture can actually be a relatively you know, feasible tool on the table um, when you think about Electrofuels and how much that cost, or um, even biofuels and, and the premium associated with that. So we've seen companies like United Airlines commit to going net zero by directly purchasing carbon removal, um, in addition to obviously the Microsoft and Stripes of the world doing it on a voluntary basis. But it seems like corporates are starting to think about this in order to be a real tool in their toolbox for decarbonizing their actual businesses. Um, that's that's one that's one thing I would think about. And then as an investor in the space too, I think the way you can get most comfortable with this is it's hard to see this as a typical venture investment like enterprise SaaS, where you're looking at a five to seven year exit. 
but this is a 10 to 15 year kind of time horizon. So I think why we've seen such a low um, diversification of venture investors in this space is you need to really have the right kind of time horizon, the right kind of um, patient capital set up in order to invest in the sector. Not to say there won't be, you know, returns in the long run, but it's going to take at least, I'd, I'd say like 10 to 15 years to get there. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the framework I would use to think about carbon removal and uh, investing as a venture investor in this space. Kim, if, if you don't mind me jumping in with a, with a, another stupid question, um, what are some of the mechanisms that you see playing out over that long period of time that makes you optimistic? So, uh, for, for example, uh, I, I'm encouraged by, say, the European Central Bank saying that, like, hey, if you're making steel now and you can prove that your steel is a low carbon steel, we'll actually give you basis point reduction on official loans. And you can obviously use financial models to flow that out. There, there's an actual cash value. Um, is there is it more of that stuff that's going to drive that kind of robust market pricing? Are there other factors that make you excited? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I think obviously there's a lot of great stuff going on in Europe right now. Um, they're kind of on the other end of the spectrum. So let's if we focus a little bit at home in, in the U.S., there's also a lot of really positive signals right now. So I think the two most talked about are the 45Q and the LCSF, LCFF, California's uh, LCSF. So on the 45Q front, there's a couple of different it's so if, for those who don't know 45q is uh ccs tax credit almost similar to the solar and and uh wind I, itc ptc uh credit but for carbon capture and storage projects so right now that's at um i think it's 50 dollars per ton and there's a bunch of barriers around what counts and what doesn't count um but definitely a promising kind of signal towards the ccs market and then on top of that there's the lcs LCFS, which ranges from like $100 to $200 per ton. So already you have, you know, 50 to 100, however you want to call it, of credits available to directly go towards CCS. And that's why a lot of people, a lot of investors, when we look at this market, we almost draw like a $100 per ton of CO2 threshold for the price that, um, you know, the market is willing to pay for carbon removal. Just because of these credits alone, and then um, baking in some conservatism and also just $100 seems like a, a nice number. So it's almost like a race to who can get to that $100 per ton of CO2 first, because there's actually, you know, credits and there's a market there that exists right now, today. The issue is from a kind of DAC and, and permanence perspective, it's quite difficult to get to that $100 as we stand today. But that doesn't mean we can't do that in the next five to 10 years. Super helpful. And then, Thanks, Kim. And then even aside from credits, right? Um, an example of a company that, that might be a good one to quickly chat through is, uh, and I believe we wrote a profile on this relatively recently, a company called Remora, which does mobile carbon capture on the back of semi-trucks. So they're squarely a CCS company, um, uh, hardware-based, right? Think of wedging this piece of hardware between the cab of the truck and, and, and the um, capacity, like storage capacity in the back. Um, a use series of filters and capture and filter the CO2 and then the CO2 gets offloaded at a tanker site and those tanks are owned by Remora um, and Remora then pipes that, puts it into tanker trucks and takes it, here's the important part, takes it to a willing customer that is buying that CO2 for carbon to value. So lots of what we've been talking, what we have been talking about here is in the storage perspective of carbon for carbon's drawdown sake. Um, it's also notable that lots of the deals we've been tracking are in that carbon to value segment where carbon is being um, sequestered in some way and then converted into a value added product. Everything from chemicals and industrial inputs, cement, um, bioplastic, like, uh, sorry, pl plastics through to vodka and diamonds and fun consumer goods. Um, there's high willingness to pay there and actually quite a shortage of available CO2. And so lots of these CCS companies are able to um, convert it into um, products that is um, uh, uh, the folks are willing to pay for. So example with Remora there of combining that hardware um, with that offloading kind of conversion willingness to pay. I think that's a good opportunity to bring in, uh, bring in Peter to talk about kind of this premise of like, yeah, why, why are we having this discussion today? Like what's, what's the problem with, that, you know, with, with where things are at and, and what, needs to, what needs to change? So here's Peter. 
It's a great question. Uh, we're still at the very early stages of the carbon removal industry. So a lot needs to happen and a lot needs to change. But I think given this audience, one of the key roadblocks that exist is access to capital. And so um, there are a few investors who have really committed to um, supporting carbon removal companies at large, but very few. And so um, I think that is one of the big unlocks that still exists for this industry is how can we bring in the billions of private dollars that are currently sitting on the sidelines into the into carbon removal. And the reason why I think is just very clear that just like every technology, carbon removal needs to go down the experience curve. So the more we do of it, the more uh, accessible it'll be, the cheaper it'll become, which will then drive more adoption. And so you start this incredible flywheel going where it just drives the cost down to the point where this can become, high quality carbon removal can become the dominant way that we are dealing with hard to abate emissions and historical emissions. Peter, how do you think about the, um, the future of that, uh... carbon removal, carbon utilization, like? Where, yeah, where are you at on, on that when we talk about these carbon uh, carbon markets? I think we need everything, right? I think like uh, carbon utilization is easily can be easily described as a, a multi-trillion dollar industry, right? So everything that we use to build uh, products using fossil fuels as a first input can be fully replaced with, with uh, carbon utilization. And so that's things like fuels, that's chemicals, that's textiles, some sort of some food sources, plastics, massive industry. And so um, I think that will be a really big unlock for building a, a fully decarbonized society. In terms of carbon removal itself, uh, the, the market for it isn't quite as specific today, but I think, uh, I, I usually don't like to give sports analogies, but like this is the only one I know in this case, but I think it's Wayne Gretzky he said, you skate to where the puck is going, not to where it is today. And so while there is no market today, you only have to look at the data, right? So um, almost every company in the Fortune 500 is either has announced a net zero plan or a sustainability plan, or will be in the very near future. Uh, investors are putting in massive amounts of dollars in a select few of carbon removal companies, but what used to take a carbon removal company 12 years to accomplish, they're now accomplishing in roughly 18 months. Um, and so this, it's, it's not hard to see a future where this is gonna become a massive industry uh, and whether that's funded through uh, private dollars, through corporate dollars or through uh, government dollars is somewhat unknown now, but the cost of climate change is starting to be realized now in, in, in the real world. So I think it's estimated now that 85% of people are, are subject to some extreme form of climate change and that it's affecting their lives. And we're even seeing some reinsurance companies start to invest in carbon removal because they see it as an existential threat to their business. So I think the question of where do the dollars come into this space is somewhat undetermined but is also feeling like it's inevitable at this point. That's helpful. Can you just, can you kind of dot the I there in the sense of it's, it seems like you've made a clear case. There's, you know, there's a market for, for utilization. The market for removal is not, it's, it's emerging. Can you just kind of bring that, bring that home? So right now, the idea that uh, anyone, a company, a person can emit emissions into the air and not pay for it is what economists would call uh, an unpriced externality. So there is a cost to society. Someone is paying that, and it's usually individuals through health costs, governments through infrastructure costs, and most of these costs are actually going to be um, backloaded. So we're not seeing them today, but they're going to be very heavy and extreme in the coming decades. And so um, at some point, we need to... Uh, pay the piper, as they say, like we will have to pay for this in one way or another. And so as a society, we need to decide um, how, how are we going to do that? So with utilization, it's easy because you make a product, which then you sell and there are economics associated with that. As of today, outside of 45Q and LCFS uh, and some other marketplaces uh, around the world, there really isn't economics tied to how do we take CO2 out of the air, which is entropically much harder than actually putting it in the air in the first place and then put it back into uh, storage. Yeah, usually it's, uh, geological storage, but there are other ways to do it too. And so we need to think about how are we going to pay for that? And I think my thesis on this is that corporates are probably gonna step up in the short term and as part of their net zero and probably eventually net negative sustainability plans, they'll be investing heavily in the space and hopefully will drive the field further down the cost curve to the point where then things like LCFS and 45Q will drop it down to that magic hundred dollar number that was mentioned before. I think that is right. Um, and so, but the big, I think, unlock is when do governments start buying this? 
because we have so many examples of this of, in history where uh, super fun sites or we even waste disposal, like when you take your trash out or take your recycling out, those are companies, but they are backed by government. So government does have this role in making sure that we have environments that are clean and healthy for everyone. And so I think the big question is, when is the probably the US federal government stepping in and buying millions of tons and hopefully eventually billions of tons of removals? With, with my kind of investor hat on, you know, let's say I meet a, a, a team, a, a company that says, look, we don't care about policy. We don't think policy has a role to play in the future of carbon removal. How, what, would you, what would you give me as, as advice for, for considering that, that company? To the company itself? What, what advice uh, to would me I... as the investor. Uh, so I think that's fine. Like, I think one of the challenges of starting a company in CDR is that you don't, don't have just this technical risk that you need to solve, but the market risk exists as well. So if they have a plan for how they're going to reach customers or, or find that beachhead of customer who will pay for their early development, that's not government. That's great. Like government is almost certainly going to be a big part of the success of this industry, but the timeline is certainly uncertain. Like I'm not going to pretend like it's not. And so I think they do need to be thinking about as startups, who they sell to, um, and, and how are they going to unlock more dollars in the currently exist in the space? Because, I mean, right now, to be perfectly honest, in, in the voluntary credit space, it's something like $20 million a year, which is just not very much. We need at least several orders of magnitude more than that. And so actually, I would say that's an incumbent, it's incumbent on the investor to ask those questions is of how do you get to market? How do you build your first economics? And then maybe even the bigger question is, yes, you shouldn't rely on governments. But what, how are you going to engage with government? So you are going to accelerate the process. How can these companies be the change makers uh, to convince lawmakers that this is something that we need? Peter, to, to that to that end, um, can you comment on which governments uh, and in the U.S. that might be state level, even you know where do you see the most traction, the most progress, the most acceleration toward this future? Yeah, um, we're, we're seeing definitely a lot of progress in individual states, and it's probably the ones you would guess. So California and New York is getting pretty big into it. Um, but the I would say the uh, the slope of the curve on the federal government side is much more uh, steep than we expected. So with this new administration, we're seeing a lot of motion, including the Office of Fossil Energy is now being called the Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management. So the entire mandate of that whole uh, group within the DOE has changed. And so the rumors are, rumors are that they're going to be announcing things very soon. There are some interesting programs that they're gonna put out. So uh, you have to think of this in terms of timescales where literally like three or four years ago, the amount of money the federal government was putting into carbon removal was on the order of like maybe tens of millions of dollars. It was just effectively insignificant and rounded down to zero at the scale of the federal government. Um, but now it is literally billions of dollars. So the acceleration we're seeing on that side is extremely exciting, but of course not sufficient. We need a lot more. Any uh, speculation in terms of the, so you talk about this, this short term need for more, uh, more on the side of corporations. Uh, it's around $20 million a year right now, if you count Stripe, Shopify, Microsoft. How do you, uh, any, any thoughts on how you see that growing uh, in the next few years? Yeah, so I think this is like, I think it's a William Gibson quote that the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. I think this is a perfect example of that, where you have a few companies who, yes, have like massive margins in their business and can afford to invest in this really crazy field of carbon removal as, you know, a brand and a PR building exercise. That is what it is. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's great that they're doing that. But I think they're also seeing the future. That there is going to be pressure from investors, from employees, from from customers to, to for these companies to take responsibility for their impact on environments. And if it comes to 2030, 2040, 40, and all of a sudden everyone's like, hey, you need to remove all your historical emissions, go ahead and spend that down. And we've not done the hard work of actually investing in the carbon removal industry today. Not only is that going to be wildly expensive to do, like literally like hundreds of billions of dollars for each of these companies. It's just not going to be possible in the first place because we, the infrastructure that we're going to need to build out is immense. And so the key piece is that these companies are not stupid. They know that this is coming. They know what they need to do. And so many of them are thinking very deeply today around how they can start making those strategic investments today to start really seeding the industry, um, getting their feet wet and trying to understand what it is to actually invest in carbon removal because it is a much more complicated field than just buying an offset on a marketplace that you find on a website. It's much more complex, um, but the outcomes are, are much higher quality. And so that's the trade-off that I think we're dealing with today. Nice, really appreciate your perspective. I wanna bring Diego in at this point. Uh, Diego's uh, the CEO of Pachama. 
Uh, and I figured we'd have some really good thoughts on this so far. Diego, how's this conversation, like this conversation so far, from your perspective as, a, as an entrepreneur, you're on some of the, you know, the other side of this in terms of you're raising money for your, for your company. How's this all sound to you? Yeah, thank you, Tito, and thank you everyone for the contributions. I guess just to tell you a little bit our story uh, and then what we're seeing on the market, you know, we came from uh, the insight that we have between one and two billion hectares in the planet available for forest restoration. Uh, we have uh, four billion hectares of standing forest that today sequester 15% uh, of current uh, emissions and that we are decimating, you know, like the Amazon rainforest to do cattle ranching, right? Um, and, you know, because of the uh, lack of uh, pricing of the externalities that Peter was mentioning, um, and we have oceans that also sequester lots of carbon and, and other coastal ecosystems that can sequester a lot more carbon than they do today with not so much complicated interventions. And yet uh, there wasn't an infrastructure by which we corporations or governments uh, could invest in effective uh, carbon removal from uh, reforestation and conservation at scale, right? So we figured that uh, there was room for a technology company that could uh, bring all the advancements that the technology world had made on remote sensing. And I'm talking about new satellites uh, collecting daily images of high definition of the entire planet, LIDAR that we can today uh, collect three-dimensional uh, data sets of forests worldwide. And of course, deep learning and machine learning in general uh, to process all that data and be able to estimate with accuracy and precision uh, the current removal uh, produced by reforestation projects and be able to monitor that over time. And then use that data to fund uh, reforestation and conservation at scale uh, in a system that could actually uh, work for everyone involved. So that was the idea of the company. Um, to be honest, at the start, uh, I had no idea, you know, I, I was not coming from this world. I was a technology entrepreneur in other fields. I had no idea whether there was a market for this or not, but I knew that there was a need if we were to solve climate change. I knew that the role of forest and other ecosystems was going to be key in the next few decades, and that we were going to need this infrastructural layer of verification, monitoring, accounting, and payments uh, for ecosystem services uh, that provide that carbon removal. Now, we started a company. The first thing we did was I, I went to my buddies at Y Combinator. I had done Y Combinator with my previous company, and I said, hey, I think you know, I have this crazy idea. I don't know if there is a market for this or not, but I know that this is going to be needed. And uh, some of you guys might know Gustav Alstromer, who's a partner at YC. He told me, do it. We're going to fund you. And they actually fund me at the PowerPoint presentation stage. We, we didn't have uh, anything at, the point, at that point. Um, and then after that, we were very fortunate that the first person that Gustav introduced us was Chris Aka and Clay Dumas who were starting with lower carbon, right? And they were also looking at all the ways in which, uh, you know, we could solve climate change. They also had, uh, you know, forest as one of the verticals that they wanted to focus on. And they also made a faith investment, uh, I would say. Um, but I can tell you what happened in the last three years since that uh, moment. Uh, we've seen an incredible growth of the voluntary market for carbon removal and for carbon credits in general. The world of the traditional world of carbon credits is evolving uh, in that it used to be in the first generation of carbon offsets or carbon credits, you could get credits for renewable energy, for solar farms, right? Uh, at some point that didn't become uh, uh, you know, additional anymore because now a solar panel, which is great news driven by in, in investments and scale is now economically viable on its own, right? So, the world of carbon credit has moved away from renewable energy. It used to be that you could get carbon credits for energy efficiency, uh, or there used to the, the first generation of carbon credits allowed companies to set a cap, and if you reduce, uh, you know, uh, from a certain cap, you could sell those allowances to others. Right? The market is moving away from that, and the market is moving towards carbon removal. Right? And in carbon removals, of course, 
you know, uh, reforestation is going to play a role, but there is this, this, this role for other forms of carbon removal that have been mentioned before. Uh, you know, uh, in addition to the pioneering companies that are focusing exclusively on carbon removal, what we're seeing other large corporations do is to say, um, you know, for scope one and two, we are going to do carbon removal for scope three, which is all the emissions that the entirety of your activities cause in the world, um, we're going to use, you know, other forms of carbon offsetting, right? So all that is to say the carbon markets uh, are evolving. They are moving towards quality. They are moving towards integrity. The price is rising, which is also allowing, you know, more projects to exist. And, and you know, I, I was seeing someone on the chat asking around COP. I do think that in this COP, there's going to be important progress. Uh, when it comes to a forest in particular, one of the things that is on, on debate yet is, well, who should do avoidance of deforestation? Should be done at the local level or should be done uh, you know, at, a, at a government level, jurisdictional level, right? So there is this idea of nesting projects within a jurisdiction, right? And these are things that if we can arrive to an agreement, there's gonna be more clarity and more projects can get started. So in general, um, I am personally more bullish than when I started the company around there being a market for uh, carbon removal. Uh, my, uh, our focus is gonna to continue to be on forestry and other you know, uh, ecosystem restoration type of projects which can benefit from this remote sensing approach. But uh, I absolutely think that, um, that there's going to be opportunities on every vertical of carbon removal. And I also seen, by the way, uh, a growth of investment interest, right? So I think that on, on every stage from C to Series B uh, and maybe beyond that, I, I, I see more and more uh, investors seeing the opportunity here. So yeah, just super excited. Um, we need more capital, we need more talent, and we need more startups. Beautiful. I wanted to circle back to this idea of uh, these, you know, these voluntary markets. I think publicly what we're seeing is, is software companies, Stripe, Shopify, Microsoft. Do you have any sense of what the next kind of group of companies that are going to get into carbon removal might be? What does that, what does that future look like? Yeah, no, and there is a bigger group than that, by the way. You know, we are working already with you know, Salesforce, for example, we announced uh, uh, you know, two weeks ago that we, we did a partnership with Salesforce. Salesforce is serving millions of companies and they announced a product called the Sustainability Cloud that is basically a carbon accounting software that will help all their corporations do carbon accounting and then source uh, you know, projects that they can use to uh, compensate their current emissions after they have done uh, reductions of emissions. So I think there are many of these platform companies that will multiply their impact. Uh, but I'll say that every publicly traded company in the US and Europe either has made a pledge or is about to make a pledge around reaching net zero. Beautiful. This is good. I want to go back to I want to go back to Xiao and see how we're how are we doing, Xiao? Your 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 questions, your your pondering about this. What uh, what are you hearing? Definitely hearing more momentum and excitement in the space than I, I probably previously uh, understood. It definitely seems like there's a lot of things happening here. Is there a are we are we at a tipping point? When you say momentum, is are we talking about kind of something linear, or is there is there a tipping point, or is that tipping point ahead? Where, where are you at with it? Yeah, I, I think I think nothing we do is linear, which is a good thing and a bad thing. Um, it, it sounds pretty obvious to me that um, there are interesting companies like Remora or Noya that have found this sort of like verticalized structure to kind of create what, what I would call that kind of Mr. Burns model. Clearly, you know, e even if you didn't give a shit about carbon, you would still see those businesses as incredibly vital and just a good idea. I, I think the, the challenge is, and I, this, I think this is an opportunity here as well, you know, the opportunity to be creator around these business models to expand that scope so that instead of just one or two companies fitting that mold coming out, that we, we need that to be 10x, 100x, 1000x, such that I think that model carries to what you are saying, Tito, the billions of dollars that are probably sitting on the sidelines now into being active participants into this market. 
Nice. I wanted to circle back and uh, pull in some some questions from some of the investors who are in the audience. Um, this is one I was going to ask Peter. You had touched on this earlier. Uh, Elena Cavallero from the Grantham Foundation asked, where is there a capital gap in financing CDR? First off, just want to say hello to our friends at Grantham. We love you very much. And thank you for all your support and everything in this space. Um, I think there are a lot of capital gaps. I, I would say the one area where it seems like there is less of one is on, in the R&D phase. And we like to be fair, we need a lot more R&D. It's not clear to me that the technology uh, that we need to get to $100 or sub $100 a ton at the scale we need exists. So we should keep doing R&D. But um, I think that is largely uh, there. And I think it's probably one of the easiest ways to fundraise from the government on. Um, I think at the deployment stage, like especially at the pilot deployment, like getting money to build your first plant to just really show that the, both the technology and the economics can potentially work and be viable. Because before that, all you really have is hopefully like a very high quality uh, LCA and, and techno-economic model, which is super important. But in some cases with some technologies, the next step after that is let me build a 10 or $20 million plant. And there really isn't anything in between those two. And so if we wanna really give these companies a chance to prove that this can work and that um, you know, less risk tolerant capital is going to flow in, especially project finance is gonna be a huge problem. I think we need those dollars to exist. The project finance thing is another big area. I think that'll get solved as the world becomes more familiar with carbon removal and, and there's more success proof points that come out. But in the short term, that will be a problem. Like I think the question of how even a, a relatively established CDR company gets the money to build their next plants at a reasonable interest rate, that's also kind of an open question in the short term. Nice. I bet Kim and Sophie have thoughts on this as well. So yeah, <laughs> I was, no, no, I think I, I was actually just going to second exactly what Peter said. I think from a, you know, from a venture perspective, there's not a ton of activity, but there's a significant amount of activity in term to kind of be able to capitalize and say the, you know, seed series A stages of some of these uh, carbon removal companies, especially when they're, you know, at the R and D phase or there's grants and a plethora of other capital funding sources, but the, the, the barrier that a lot of these removal companies run into is, you know, we've proven it out at lab scale. Now we have to get to a pilot. And you're right. It's like usually a five to $10 million minimum uh, CapEx pilot they need to build. And the only pathway to get that funding right now is through venture equity, which is, as you all know, the most expensive form of capital um, not, and, and it's uh, dilutive as well. And there aren't really any other forms of capital for first of a kind projects. So, um, you know, a debt lender or a project financier who's willing to go a little bit earlier. And there's a reason for that as well. It's because it's super high risk and low return. You're looking at, you know, single, low, probably single digit IRR returns. Um, so that's, that's, there's a reason why there's that gap in funding is because the, you know, returns profile, the risk to return profile just isn't super attractive. So whoever can figure out a way to solve that problem, I think can find a way to better address that capital gap. I'm just going to drop uh, another profile that we wrote actually last week um, with activate org. The another, we need to do another like heart for Grantham and for activate as well. Um, uh, and the new CDR initiative, I believe they call it the CDR imperative of accelerating companies out of the lab with a focus on those founder scientist types and uh, along with a fellowship that um, is like a solid <laughs> wage to live off of with benefits and access to lab space. Most importantly, um, Stripe and hopefully other, some other companies soon will be chipping in money to buy that first, I believe it's $50,000 or so worth of product. Um, about as early as you can get um, in the company development cycle. So there's this concept of, um, you know, we write quite a lot about corporate venture capital capital funds, and there's some challenge there with how close do you want your customer to get when that customer can potentially bias you away from um, just solving for their problems as opposed to solving for the entire total addressable market. Um, and so having these trusted inter intermediaries, for example, like Activate that really has the uh, founder scientist perspective first coming in and brokering in that um, early willingness to pay from the customer side could be a new, entirely novel, interesting model for accelerating this innovation from the customer pool. Nice, while we're on this topic, I, um, 
I do see Mike Robinson comment in the, in the chat. He says the government R&D funds are available, but they're limited and slow. Uh, what we need is a private accelerator that funds R&D uh, and offers a pipeline to, to scale financing. Peter, I think there's probably something you, you touched on and might have some thoughts on. Do you have any, any, any comments on this? I think there definitely is still a gap up in the entrepreneurial support landscape, although I think that gap is closing very quickly. So let's say even three years ago, there were very few accelerators that would credibly take CDR companies and actually add like unique value. But uh, I think that landscape has changed. Air Miners has incredible programs that you should all look into. Um, but I think there are others that are popping up as well with uh, Activates uh, is, is a new one. Y Combinator isn't as vocal about it anymore, but they will take carbon removal companies. And I think there also is some interesting areas at the, at the edge of it around synthetic biology and genetics. And there are accelerators like Indie Bio that are looking at that. So I think it's there. Um, I, I think government does play a role though, right? Like there are certain types of problems that need to get solved from a, a science and technology perspective that private industry is not going to touch. And honestly, they shouldn't because we don't know if it's going to work. And so I think government stepping in and trying to catalyze the creation of new industries and, and de-risk them to the point where private capital can come in makes a lot of sense. I think the trade-off there is that, yes, it is very slow and the process is very annoying. And I don't know if there's a way around that. I, I think the, the most clever companies I've seen find ways to just, put it together and, and make it work. Uh, and that maybe is the future in the short term. But this is all, I think, a stepping stone, stone into a future where the economics for doing this are going to be so clear that there's no question that we should be investing money into this. Nice. I see another question uh, in the chat from, uh, from, from Varun Gupta. And Kim, I think this one might be good for you. In the sense of, uh, for, for investors who are you know, they, they hear you saying, hey, we need to adapt to being more of a, uh, you know, 10 to 15 year time horizon. Like, how the heck do you do that? Do you just say, oh, yeah, great. Like, I'm now I'm investing for 15 years instead of five. Like, what, what would you recommend to investors looking at this space and hearing you say, hey, you need to extend your time horizon? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, you know, typical venture fund horizons are, I think, five to seven years. But when you're investing in deep tech, hard tech, things like carbon removal that are super hard tech, you need to have patient capital. And a lot of that depends on where the capital is coming from, right? We're not, I'm not investing my money. I'm investing um, money that's given that's given to us from our LPs. So um, the model that we've come up with at Energy Impact Partners is we have a kind of comp blend of a financial and strategic model where we have more than, I think 35 now strategics um, as part of our LP coalition. So. They range from some of the largest utilities across North America and uh, Europe uh, to more traditional energy companies like Shell. We have transportation companies, Microsoft's Climate Innovation Fund as well um, as part of the coalition. And I think these are the profiles of uh, LPs that can be a little bit more patient with their capital. They're not looking to make um, a five-year return, but they're kind of in it for the long haul, both for financial returns, but also for strategic returns to their businesses to be able to see, you know, what's at the frontier of decarbonization, because that's what they're thinking about. Um, a lot of them have set 20, 40, 20, 50 net zero commitments, and they you know, have a path to get 80% of the way there, but it's hard to decarbonize that last 20%. And I think those are the areas where we can be really strategic in helping them identify those companies. Um, and then fortunately, they can also be a little patient, not needing a five to seven year return. Another really good pool of patient capital, I think, um, is the strategy that Breakthrough Energy Ventures went, which is more kind of the philanthropic um, catalytic capital path. So Breakthrough, Activate, uh, what's another one? Prime Impact. I think they've done a really good job of, you know, filling that gap in terms of patient capital, finding investors who are willing to wait, you know, 10 to 15 years in order to get their capital back and have the liquidity to kind of, uh, you know, Keep, keep afloat in the meantime. So those are two sources. I think um, obviously there's going to be a lot more capital in the world that's necessary. So um, we'll kind of see if there's more investors out there that are willing to be more patient with their capital in return for you know potentially making a really strong impact on carbon removal. That's spot on. And it's a really wise question from Varun as well. It's also one of the structural differences that we've noted between Clean Tech 1.0 and what's different this time is structurally setting up your return horizon as a fund to better fit the asset class of climate tech, which 
inherently seems to take longer. So um, these are wise questions for founders that might be in the audience to be talking to their venture capitalists about, about what's your return timeline? Tell me about the structure of your company, about your fund, and does that line up with what we're trying to build uh, from the entrepreneurial seat? Nice. Diego, has that, uh, how's that come up on your, on your radar? Yeah, I mean, things are moving faster than I thought. Uh, and I'm seeing a lot of private equity, you know, investors coming into the game. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there is, you know, uh, the ability for early investors to exit, actually, maybe not through an IPO or an acquisition, but through new investors coming in, right? So I think that, um, you know, Again, I'm seeing every layer of the investment stack in the planet uh, having a climate mandate. And when that happens, then you all of a sudden have uh, people that can take the baton from earlier investors, right? So it might be that actually, you know, of course, this is not going to have the speed to return than a photo sharing app in Silicon Valley, but it might be that, that investors can actually uh, cash out uh, earlier than previously thought with the velocity that I'm seeing. But that being said, yes, every time and, and uh, you know when when I chose my investors, I was I was very upfront about the the long term uh, you know uh, nature of these businesses, the mission uh, priority, right? Mission over profits, uh, which I think is fundamental when we're talking about. Uh, uh, things that if they work will have big impacts on ecosystems and, and, and the planet at large, resources on the planet at large. So um, yes, it's a different ball game. It requires mission alignment and long-term thinking. Excellent. Uh, I wanted to pull it back a little bit uh, from, from long-term thinking to back to short-term thinking. So uh, COP has come up, Conference of Parties meeting is coming up in, uh, in November. Just kind of uh, popcorning around to everybody, any, any uh, predictions or expectations about what we'll see in terms of voluntary markets um, uh, or, or even regulatory markets for carbon removal specifically? I, I mean, in my case, uh, the one thing I can comment is Article 6 is an article that has implications for carbon markets. Uh, you know, if there is, it's an article that is very high level and, and there aren't Kind of like clear uh, agreements about the implementation of carbon markets in different countries. That's one that I'm really looking forward to seeing what uh, happens this year about. Um, and I, I do think uh, I was seeing yesterday John Kerry saying that we're going to get a lot of positive surprises. And I, you know, knock on wood, hopefully that is the case. Uh, China announced a huge uh, biodiversity fund uh, yesterday. We might see, you know, announcements from European countries uh, and from even corporations that might take COP to announce uh, funds uh, and, and pledges and commitments around carbon removal and carbon markets. I'm not going to make any predictions per se, but I think what should I hope happens is one that although we do need, I think, global cooperation to solve this problem we don't require cooperation to get started. So, I mean, the U.S. has itself has a huge emissions historical footprint that we need to take care of. It is our responsibility. And so there's nothing stopping us from getting started now. And so we should work with others, but we, this is an opportunity for the U.S. to be a leader. And this is inevitably going to be a massive industry. So this could be the replacement for the fossil fuel industry in the U.S. And it could actually be even bigger than it has been historically. So let's take that opportunity. I think also hopefully there's some discussion around um, quality. And so that, that's uh, taking into account things like additionality and permanence and linkage. And these are very hard things to quantify and measure and deal with, but it needs to be done because otherwise we're not going to have the climate impact that we think we're going to have. And then we all suffer. And so I think that's something that I think the world governments have done very poorly in the past. And so if, if we have any chance of doing this better then that is something that needs to change. Sophie, you had mentioned permanence before. Do you want to? Do you have any uh, anything to add on that? More of a cry for help <laughs> and hope that uh, um, we are reaching some definitions right around what this unit is that we're talking about. Uh, I can say from whatever Chatham House rules like back back end conversations with a lot of investors and folks that are um, putting money to work in this space. 
there isn't a common understanding of what like metrics we're really talking about here. And I share that um, mostly to spur forward what I think is a really important thread um, in the conversation and what I think a lot of the pricing discussion hinges on as well. Good, well said. I think we'll I think we'll leave it there for the day. This is, uh, after all, a conversation. Uh, this will continue to continue to, to to figure it out. Thank you all for for being here today. Thank you all for being part of this. Uh, was, yeah, really really appreciate all your all your insights uh, and and looking forward to continuing to build this build this industry. Indeed, thank you, and thank you, Tito, for uh, for moderating today. Uh, just want to say some thanks to Diego, Kimberly, Sophie, Peter, and, and Xiao uh, for, for your contributions to the conversation today. And again, it is an ongoing conversation. Um, to that end, we also have a good number of other Air Miners events. I shared some links in the chat for our events calendar. Also, to if you want to apply to Air Miners, uh, link there, our Air Miners Launchpad. Uh, don't also forget our post event survey. We'd love to hear how we did today, how we can make events like this uh, again in the future, how we can improve and deliver something that's going to accelerate the pace of developing our industry to achieve the quintessential thousand shots on goal and unlock the market opportunities that are just uh, that, that are out there so that we can impact the planet, remove carbon from the atmosphere. Uh, so this is the end of uh, the formal program. I just want to say once more, thank you to our audience as well. And I look forward to the next time that we our paths cross again at an airminers event. So feel free to stay on at the end if you want to continue to participate in Zoom uh, breakout networking. Until then, uh, cheers and good luck. <laughs>